thank you so much for both being uh, here for this virtual uh, Q and A. We're, we're we're so thrilled to be showing the film. We, we'd love to be showing it on our big screen, but we're we're glad um, that our audiences are st are still able to find it. Um, it got actually it got a rave review from I don't know if you you read reviews or if it's too difficult to do because you're so close to the subject, but. Um, our, our local critic, the Boston Globe, gave it four stars. He said it's one of the year's most affecting and subtly radical movie experiences. Um, and it's great because he's been giving us two and a half stars consistently for all of our other virtual screening room titles. So look, we finally broke through on this one. Um, and it's, it's an incredible film. Um, so yeah, well, do you read reviews or how, what, what, what has this whole process been like, I guess, especially as <laughs> uh, I, I don't like to read the uh, that many reviews. <laughs> I'm uh, afraid of the sentences from the bad reviews being stuck in my mind. Uh, so uh, I heard Lin Ullmann, the daughter of Ingvar Bergman, talk about this. Uh, he, 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 uh, she said that when Ingvar Bergman was, had the dementia uh, and was really old, he didn't know uh, who he, he was. He didn't know where he lived, who his daughter was, but he could remember all bad reviews from the 60s and 70s. Uh, so, uh, and I, I, I've read some bad reviews before and, uh, and they kind of stuck in my mind. So I tend to not read that many reviews, but I, I, uh, I read a few parts of the Boston Globe. So I think that's uh, a secure review for me to read probably. Yes, absolutely. Uh, it's funny you bring up Lee Volman's actually. She's a, she's a friend of the Coolidge. We're sending her a link to this because we, we, we love her so much and we know she'll adore that she's out of town at the moment. But um, she's a terrific person. I don't know. It's funny that you brought her up. Um, but I, just to start at the beginning, how did you, so how did you um, first meet Barbara? How did you encounter the subject? Um, can you walk us through that process a bit? Absolutely. So uh, I was very fascinated by art rob. So that was how I uh, came uh, over the story. So I was researching art robberies. And then this story was in the front newspapers in Norway. So uh, after reading about it, I thought it was a really cool setup. Like the Barbara had approached the thief during uh, the trial and asked if she could paint him. Uh, I got uh, quite early in the process, but, but I and Paul Buckley had met four times when I began filming. Uh, before that, what you see in the film is a lot of archival footage. So we were very fortunate to have a friend of Barbara that had filmed a lot um, before I came along. And um, we had surveillance footage. We also had the, 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 uh, the audio recordings from the trial. Uh, so we had a lot of uh, archival footage before I came along. And when I began filming, I did not know anything where the story might end up. So uh, I was actually planning to do a 10 minute uh, short documentary for web TV in Norway. Uh, and gradually I understood uh, like after some months that it, this is not going to be a 10 minute documentary. It's going to be a, a bigger project than that. So kept on filming first. So that was how it all started. But we knew nothing about where it uh, would end up. We, I thought it was very just fascinating people, Barbara and Carl Buckley, and I had so many questions. I was, there were so many things I was curious about. Yeah. So, and so, so, oh, you're breaking up the, a little bit. The, the, It seems like Oslo is in strange zone. Yeah, we, we kind of we cut out for a second. I think we caught most of that. What, so what was it about art robberies in particular that appealed to you? You know, Boston is one of the sites of the, the most, I guess, infamous art robberies, the Isabella Stewart Gardner Museum. They made it off with uh, 13 Dutch uh, masterworks from Rembrandt and Vermeer, and they're still missing. There's actually a $10 million oh. reward. If you want to film a sequel, solve it, <laughs> finance your future film. <laughs> Um, but what was it about art robberies that uh, appealed? So um, I, I think that um, you have the contrast there. You have art, which is high culture, and robbers, which is low culture. I think that's fascinating. Why do they steal paintings, and especially Barbara paintings, where we like, uh, where should they sell it? Because Barbara wasn't well known. They, 
we had some Edvard Munch robberies in Norway before. Uh, so I think that like art robberies, it raises a lot of questions and there, there's like a big contrast there uh, with the art community and robbers. I think that's very fascinating. Yeah, no, it, it really is. And I think, um, you know, the film, the, the title is so sort of simple on the surface, the painter and the thief. And I think people come to, you know, you have sort of an idea in your mind of who these people might be and the, just how you structured it. And you, you go so deep into Barbara and, and Bertel's lives. I, I think that that's really a, a fascinating thing. And he's certainly, I think, when you think of a thief, people don't necessarily see somebody like Bertel and the level of appreciation he has for, for art. Um, and I think just in filming, I'm, I'm curious, Barbara, um, it, it seems like it, it really required a lot of trust in, in Benjamin throughout. And did you, how, you know, were you initially skeptical when he approached you or what was your thinking in, in getting involved with, with the project? So the, my very first surprise was, first of all, when Benjamin called me. Um, never experienced anything like that before. So I was, of course, yeah, it's a nice little new challenge. So let's see what comes out of it. And uh, I think then it only took like half an hour and Benjamin was in my atelier after the phone call. And I was so surprised how young man uh, he is, or he was, is. Uh, I don't know why I would have imagined that a documentary filmmaker must be over 40 plus. Uh, I don't know. But very, very suddenly or Im immediately did I feel that Benjamin is somebody who really wakes up trust in people, in me definitely. And uh, not that I would want to speak for Bertil, but I think the same happened with Bertil. Otherwise, we would not uh, go for it. So it was definitely the total sensitivity, sensibility and openness uh, of Benjamin that uh, made us quite fast secure that, uh, yeah, he can be around us for some time. Yeah, and how, so how long did the filming uh, take place? And as it went on, did you find, were you really conscious of him standing there with a camera or did it kind of fade into the background? So, sort of how did it evolve over time? Benjamin says that he was around me with the camera for three years. Uh, I very seldom have noticed him. So <laughs> he very fast <laughs> turned into the so-called fly on the wall for me definitely. And I think for Bertil too. Once more, as I said, it's the sensitivity that both Benjamin and the photographer, Christopher Kumar, both of these people have. And so it really makes them invisible in the room. And so you have all the space for yourself as if they were not there, indeed. Yeah, no, and it was, I mean, I think you, it was tremendously, I, I, I don't know what's brave is maybe the word, because I think you, you and Bertel were both incredibly candid and you really opened your lives and your struggles up to Benjamin, up to ben, out, uh, to Benjamin, and it was just it was, that was I thought an incredibly moving part of the film. I'm wondering what it was like for you um, seeing the film. Did, I don't know if you watched it in a dark room by yourself or if you were at a festival, and what it was like seeing all of that up on screen, and and, and also just seeing what um, Bertel's observations about you, if any of it was sort of surprising or you know what that mm -hmm. was like. I think if you, when you mentioned the bravery uh, that both Bertil and I definitely must have had in order to go for it, I just need to say here that the one who really is brave here is Bertil because he put so much more at stake of himself into the movie. Uh, I don't need to tell the reasons why because you've, you've seen the film. Mm -hmm. So he is the one who really uh, must have been very brave to expose himself like that and to give the allowance to remain uh, pictured like this. The bravery from my side was like, yeah, well, I'm just standing in my atelier and paint, you know, so <laughs> be my guest, come over and get some turpentine smell if you want. <laughs> and how was it for me to watch it? First time I watched it and not like completely finished uh, with the music and so on. And of course, there is a total awkwardness in seeing oneself or even hearing oneself. Mm, and then the proper, proper uh, version of the film I've seen once, one and only time, and that was at Sundance, which was 
absolutely different experience from when you watch it on the computer at home alone or with the boyfriend or then when you sit in a cinema in Park City loaded with hundreds of people and there you suddenly understand that all these people came voluntarily to spend almost two hours of their life watching what you and Bertil have got to say that was just totally crazy and I felt smaller and smaller with every scene because I kind of felt responsible for, for all those people there. But then came something that totally blew me off and that was not only ovations but standing ovations which was just way beyond my ever imagination. And one more thing I want to say actually is that I realized observing myself watching the movie I managed to disconnect uh, myself from the fact that I'm watching myself it's a little bit like when I once in a while happen to paint myself I don't really feel like I'm painting myself or it's not essential you know what counts is the actual art form whether it's a movie or a canvas uh, so I managed to disconnect a bit maybe it's some self-protective system I don't know yeah, no, I, I, I understand what you're saying there. Um, so what was Ber uh, Bertel? Did he share his reaction with both of you? Was he with you? At, uh, has he been with you at some of these premieres? Um, uh, yes, Bertil, he, um, he saw also it for the first time before it was screened at Sundance. He was also at the Norwegian premiere in February. And actually, Bakil uh, did an interview with Vanity Fair a few days ago. He was asked the same question about how it was like to see himself uh, in the film for the first time. And his answer was, horrible, <laughs> horrible. I've seen the film. I've seen the film only once and I'm never going to see it again. The only time I will watch it again if, if it, it, it is if Benjamin makes a commentary track. <laughs> so I think the Vanity Fair journalist uh, became a bit surprised because the journalists were probably more used to getting uh, uh, other kind of answers, not more that warm and, <laughs> uh, and honest. So I think that it was a bit <laughs> I think it was a bit horrible for back to watch it, but again. Like he says, he, he really feels like he owns his story and he really uh, sees the value of the film. He really wants the film to remove stigmas from society. And when we had the screening in Oslo, he also got standing ovation. He had the fantastic Q&A afterwards that made everybody cry. And I think it's extraordinary to like see back in today because he has been sober for over a year now. Uh, he's finished his second year at his uh, studies. So, um, yeah, yeah, he had a wonderful time uh, shoving the film to Oslo audiences and we should have been traveled around the world with the film. Unfortunately, we can't do that now, but yeah. Well, let's talk about the, the, the structure of the film because, um, Benjamin, you said from the get-go, you didn't quite, you thought it was going to be 10 minutes. You didn't quite know how it would evolve. Um, did, did you quickly uh, come to understand that you were gonna sort of shift and uh, show both perspectives or did you kind of initially think, oh, I'll sort of follow Barbara? Um, how did that all come together? Because it's, it's brilliant, I think, what you did structurally with the film. Thank you, thank you. <laughs> uh, um, that actually happened in the editing room. So in the editing room, we really wanted to, um, show what an intelligent, charismatic, funny guy Bakke is. And the only way to do that, I thought, was to see the world from his perspective. And uh, uh, then we came up with the idea that we wanted to do change perspectives. We had, of course, filmed it in a way that we followed both Barbara and Paul Bakke alone a lot of the time. So we had uh, the possibility to, to do that. Uh, also, since the, the, the film, uh, the themes we are exploring in this film uh, are what we humans do in order to be seen and appreciated and what it takes of us to, to see others and, and help others. Uh, I think that to, to uh, shift perspectives and jumping back and forth in time, that also added some complexity to the themes. 
And again, like uh, watching stories, usually the driving motor of, of uh, old stories, it's what will happen next. Uh, that's a driving motor. And that's, of course, very important for this film as well. But when we change perspectives and also jump back in time, uh, the question uh, changed. Then it became more of uh, why did it happen? And that is a very interesting thing, what that does with the, uh, with the viewer. Uh, uh, and also, <laughs> uh, I, uh, I took a lot of inspiration from Gestalt therapy. <laughs> uh, it's been called uh, the empty chair technique. Uh, and that's actually, you sit in a chair and you look at another person that you're imagining on the other chair and you get a lot of questions about that person. Most likely a person you have a lot of problems with. And then you uh, go into the other chair and you look at yourself from the other person's perspective. Uh, and that made a huge impression on me. Uh, it was almost uh, shocking to change seats and look at myself uh, from the other perspective. Um, and I wanted to apply that into this film. And usually when you have a film like this, when you have a, an uh, artist and a muse, uh, the artist is usually a, a man and the, the muse is a woman. Here it's uh, the artist is a, a a woman <laughs> and usually then you see uh, the world from the artist's point of view and we wanted to uh, break that kind of genre a bit and uh, hopefully it's surprising and also hopefully it, it adds some complexity to the themes we're exploring. Yeah I mean it was, it's very interesting even just to see um, what prisons are like in Norway versus the US very different and he really had access uh, hospitals for, I mean, everywhere he went. Um, how many hours of footage did you ultimately have to work through? It was over uh, 300 hours at least. Uh, mm -hmm. We had uh, around 100 recording days and um, yeah it was a lot of uh, a lot of footage there, uh, so it took a long time to edit it together. And we were, of course, also very uh, fortunate that we got access to hospitals and uh, prisons in Norway. That was, of course, crucial for us. Yeah, yeah absolutely. Um, so, Barbara, can you talk a little bit about the paintings that were stolen? Um, you, you do address it a bit in the film, but can you talk about specifically um, you know, how meaningful they were to you and, and give us some more, because they're beautiful. They're both beautiful works of art. Um, can, can you speak to that a bit? Sure. I don't really like to speak about my art, but damn, do I need to learn how to do it. <laughs> um, thank you for, thank you for your compliments. <laughs> thank you for your compliments, first of all. Uh, well, every painting is, uh, special to me. It's like, you know, whether it's a small one or a huge one. Yet, I have to admit that the, these two, especially the swan song, uh, was very uh, unique for me and symbolic. It was the first painting I made when I moved to Norway from Berlin, where I lived for seven years. And so, in this painting, I partly unconsciously, more like intuitively, uh, I was dealing with like, or I, I realized that there, I'm kind of closing the chapter of the less pleasant time of my life I had in Berlin with my previous partner. Um, so I sort of felt that, or understood that this is the painting where actually I somehow decided to bury it or to just put it asleep and let it rest in peace. So, it was even then more symbolic when that very painting disappeared. I even could see it as like a double urgency to like just leave the past behind, which I hope I dare to say uh, I managed to, to do. And with the other painting, the Chloe and Emma, that was a little bit uh, different story. This painting I made uh, while still in Berlin and it's a portrait of two girls. They were around five years old at that time. And I just met them that very one day on the wedding of a friend of mine in Berlin. And um, that was a moment where I was just running out of the party place to get my new package of cigarettes. I was already a little bit tipsy 
And as I was approaching out of the gorgeous place where the wedding party happened, these two girls were sitting on this amazing sofa, just like being there shouting out, paint us. So I actually did shout at them and I was screaming at them, don't you dare to move. And I ran back for my telephone and I just took some blurry picture. And from this, I made the painting. And I realized that though I've just only wanted to make a portrait of the two cute girls, the feedback I got from people was that like, but it's so spooky. So even if you try to paint something as innocent as two cute five years old girls, there anyway, something very disturbing came along. So yeah. <laughs> Well, they, they are both gorgeous works of art. I'm wondering, um, and, and this is maybe sort of too early to tell, but w with everything that's going on with the pandemic, I was reading an interview in the New York Times the other day with Spike Lee, and he's like, there's going to be a cottage industry of art that comes from this, painting, film, novels, you name it. Ha ha has it affected at all your, your artwork, your subjects, your productivity? Has it changed your, your focus at all? Is it sort of too soon to know? Um, well, it's many questions at once, but first of all, like about the impact is maybe a little bit too soon, though I have to admit that since Friday when the film uh, was released in the United States, I'm actually flooded by emails and messages uh, of many, many people who either want to express their gratitude for, for the film or, and also asking about my art. So in the last three days, I haven't been doing anything else than just answering all these because I sort of feel obliged <laughs> like that I do have to answer and I want to answer because it's, it's great that the people do want to make this one step extra and to try to approach uh, either Bertil or me or I believe also Benjamin and so I feel certain obligation to reply back. So no, I wasn't able to paint in the last three days which is a little bit, uh, it's not the most pleasant. Whether it influences my themes, I don't think so. Uh, because as much as I can reflect on my art, I believe that what I'm painting is a quite, a, let's say, deeper hum human issues, which I, I can't really see how that would be influenced by, by the movie. Uh, I'm surely not getting any brighter in my works, but I'm, st I'm still not removing the light at the end of the tunnel. And surely there are more paintings of Bertil coming up. That's what I can promise. Oh, of course, I cannot let my muse to sleep. I mean, yes. as Benjamin said, he is my muse. So, and he's still a very big source of inspiration for me. So of course it's gonna come. Uh, uh and you also got a lot of new tattoos to paint about. It is getting oh, uh, yes. all these new uh, face <laughs> tattoos these days. <laughs> giving you kind of inspiration. <laughs> it's going to be totally gorgeous painting. He has this great uh, symbol from the card play cards uh, on the on the on the cheekbone here, and it just looks so marvelous. I totally already see. It's going to be on copper plate, uh, and yeah, great dramatic light. You know, yes. <laughs> Yeah, so you're still, you're still in, it sounds like you're still regularly in touch with him. You, you see him a lot. In her. Uh, well, seeing is now it's a bit difficult because I'm not in Norway. I'm in Sweden, mm -hmm. in the woods where I have an atelier where I paint. Mm -hmm. uh, but soon the borders open so I can be coming more often to Oslo. But uh, we have social media, of course. So every day we kind of give each other a sign of life. Yeah, that's great. And Benjamin, what is, what has this experience been like for you? Have you been mostly, well, I guess, what's it like virtually, because you've promoted films in a more traditional sort of festival path. Is, is it strange to be promoting your film virtually? Um, <laughs> is it affected? <laughs> um, I think it's gr great that we have that possibility, but uh, it, it has affected me that I get so angry with, with all these technological things that doesn't work. <laughs> <laughs> uh, why doesn't internet work all the time? So I think that uh, um, it's been um, it's been uh, a really pleasant experience uh, doing this. Of course, I would love to go to the U.S. and uh, travel around. I was so much looking forward to do that. Uh, but it is as it, as it is. It's nothing we can do about it, and it's great that we have the possibility to 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 have virtual cinema and to, to it's great uh, and uh, we're, we're very fortunate to have Neo 
on, on board yeah uh, new, new future documentaries so i've uh, i've done a lot of research and talking in the phone and preparing everything and now we can begin filming again so i actually came right now from um uh filming uh, a scene from a new documentary so i'm back uh, filming yeah that's great can you say anything about it or is it is it secret for now <laughs> But I'll take that as uh, if it's on <laughs> YouTube. If it's on, <laughs> you can keep it under wraps and surprise us. Um, but we hope, well, hopefully, we can we can welcome you you both to Boston someday because this this is just such a it's a stunning film. It's so beautiful, and to see it on the big screen with an audience, um, it's person. That's something that I you know would, would love to do. I, th I think that is the one thing we miss. We're, we're we are so happy to be able to offer it to our audiences, though. Well, they're stuck indoors they might as well be experiencing some, some great art so thank you both for, for the film um, it, it's a really terrific thing and congratulations on it i'm sure we will come over thank you so one day yes we would love to do that we would love to do that <laughs> you're welcome anytime <laughs> thank, thank you. you that's that other art robbery yeah <laughs> <laughs>